was a pretty normal childhood, I think, growing up in the 50s and the early 60s. Um, Britain was obviously changing a lot in those days. Uh, the, the Second World War had ended and Britain was fairly broke, uh, so everything was being uh, established on new lines. Uh, we had the National Health Service and uh, all that sort of change was going on at the same time. Uh, I attended a grammar school uh, in 1966, uh, which was for people who had passed an examination called the 11 plus. Uh, and that was meant to sort of grade people between, unfortunately, uh, a lower tier for the secondary modern schools and a higher tier for the grammar schools. But I was only there for two years, and then the Labour government at the time introduced what they called comprehensive education, which was basically that everybody went to the same grade of school, a comprehensive school. So we kind of got mixed up in all of that and moved from being a rather sort of elitist grammar school, if you like, to being a comprehensive school. This had unfortunate consequences for most of us because uh, we merged with the local secondary modern school with whom we had had a bitter rivalry. And of course, the local secondary modern boys were a bit rougher than we were and took it out on us a fair bit. So there were a lot, a lot of fights and uh, rough and tumble, an unintended consequence of uh, introducing a, a real wide-ranging social change like that in reality. But it probably did me good because it introduced me to a, a whole range of different people I would never have met in the first place. So. I was born in Cook Lee, Đà Nẵng, Quảng Nam, Vietnam, shortly after World War II in September 1946, in the little village or quickly, that the form, form countryside, the form right. I live in the house, smaller than, than this room, but uh, no running water, no electricity. And I am the number one, number five in the family. And my parents, by the, by the time I was born, they already have four children before me. And then I have a boy and three girls. To me, number five, mom wants to have the boy so they can work in the farm. But I am the girl. And the midwife came in to cut the chemical cord. And the mom asked the midwife, is that the boy or the girl? The midwife said, that's the girl. But that's how my life started. So you left home to start living with another family and babysit for their yes. children? Yes, when I'm 11 years old. In the daytime, I, by that time I went American Bill School, I only went to the third grade. And then I went over there to be the babysit. In the nighttime, I go to school to learn how to read and write in my language. And at the age 15, my uncle write an ad for me. So I came to Saigon and worked with my uncle. In the daytime, I work, but nighttime, I go to school to learn to take in lead. And when I worked for American, the first job, I worked for the motor pool in the number one Khánh Hội. And then since that day, they moved to Long Bình, so I did not go with them. So they moved to, I went to the work for the senior officer club. And then I worked from there, and then I went to work for Special Force, where I met Commander Bola. You know, we bathe together, we sleep together, mostly in our mom's room, which is huge. She can have three, four, eight children in the same room. You know, with your mom pretty much until you grow to a certain age that you can have your own room or share with your brother. The boys sleep together and the girls will sleep in a different room. And then we would um, help the girls, help mothers cook. And then the boys do the male choices, like sweeping outside with the broom and, you know, um, helping whatever daddy needs to be done. But as a magistrate, as I grew up to be, 
For him to be a magistrate, he had a bungalow. He was, you know, we lived in a bungalow, so we had two houses. The house he had was there before he became a magistrate. So there was a bungalow with several bedrooms. As a child, I don't remember, I just knew it was huge. He had a gardener, he had a cook, and there was a driver. So he had a car that he never drove, that the driver took us anywhere or took him wherever he's traveling since he was more so of a district mag magistrate. So he traveled to the small villages um, coming in. You know, I grew up very loved and rich, and we and adore that now that we're elders, but even though it's hard to understand that two, three wives in the same home, I don't know. <laughs> and you ended up, how long did you know him when you married? Um, or it took a while because I didn't make him welcome right away. Actually, I was, I don't know how to put it because I didn't like him. Uh, he was a little pushy and demanding. And I, you know, I made him understand that I wasn't getting married. I told him, if I was getting married, you would not come here from America to meet me. <laughs> it was my first time coming here. I had nobody that I know. I was all by myself and you know, F Filipinos by nature have this Bionian spirit, like we help one another. So I meet Filipino families and they, they would give me, you know, um, advice on, hey, this is what you should do and all that stuff. So it did not take long for me to to get settled um, because I developed some friends already here but um, it's it's it was hard because I mean I was really all by myself in the Philippines I don't I don't I did not cook or do my laundry and now all of a sudden I have to do everything when I came here as an accountant then I found another accounting firm, a small accounting firm, which is the Legal Management Solutions. So I worked with Steve, Tanya, and after a few years he said, I want to retire. So he sold the business to me. So that's why um, I was able to get a loan to purchase um, his firm. And since my wife and I we're already CPAs here also. We took the test and we passed the licensures. Um, we expanded from just concentrating on law firm clients. We now expanded our uh, clientele to other non-law firms like any other business out there. I pursued two careers, one for English and one for uh, music. And the one that gave me the certification was the music. I finished music first, so then I, I left the country. And, and in America, what you have to do if the, your certificate is education, I learned that you just have to certify here into whatever um, ramifications you can have in education. And since I knew Spanish, I start pursuing the Spanish certification. You here in Florida, you're required to have uh, the knowledge first, and then of course I pass that one so easy. And then um, it, uh, you have to pass later the general knowledge of English, so and that will include math, English, composition, writing, and all that. That took a little bit of challenge because I, I just start here, but um, it worked out pretty good after. Then I did my citizenship. I'm very proud of being an American citizen in 2004. I did it because of my children, you know. I want them to know that the mama loves the country that she's now part of. I want them to be proud, and I want to be proud of myself. I think you, you can be a teacher. Um, that's not a... You cannot be a teacher if you're not a citizen. You can be a, a, a you you can have a, a a visitor be not a visitor a work visa and work as a, as a contractor from another country. But if you are here and you're living and you're forming a family, I thought that the best thing to be was a citizen. I love America, so no problem with that. I was born in Uruguay, 
uh, which is a little country in South America, on the east coast of South America, between Brazil and Argentina. Very small, three and a half million people, but nice, mostly agricultural. And um, I was born in a, a middle class family, South American middle class family. My mom and my dad, they both work. Uh, and I grew up in the capital, which is Montevideo. And uh, uh, I have a really a happy childhood, you know, I got all my parents' attention and my grandparents' attention because my mom was also, also an only child. And all I have is like great memories as a child. One of the most profound memories that I have of my childhood was when I was four or five years old and my dad bought our first television. And somebody uh, said, you know, I have an opportunity for an for a, a internship. If you want to come and help, that would be awesome. So I, that's how I did my first steps, and working, filming some very simple production and, uh, with this uh, gentleman that offered me the, the opportunity. I met somebody from Channel 4, WJXT Channel 4 here in Jacksonville. And, that, and we were talking, and we saw each other a couple times, and the gentleman was uh, in, uh, had a part-time job as a cameraman in the studio. In those days, you still had to run the cameras, you know, man the cameras, uh, each camera in the studio. And said, hey, Carlos, there is an, uh, an opening for a part-time job if you would like to try it. I said, that would, that would be awesome, a television station. Like, you know, I knew about then that it was the number one station, and I, I, I watched it several times. So I did an application, job application for Channel 4 for that position, which was very simple in the sense that they, they, you put headsets and they would tell you which shot you have to take. So you didn't have to know a whole lot about production. But I think they, the the person who did the interview for Channel 4 realized that I really wanted, and I promised that I was going to learn as much as I could, uh, but I, I really love television. And I and I, I meant it, because I was born since a child, I was watching television. I always fascinated, and now to be, uh, be able to make television, it was like a dream come true, you know? So it's a, uh, 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 like Willy Wonka probably, you know, <laughs> dream to, to <laughs> all his life about doing candy and one day he owns a candy factory. But, uh, uh, so I started in Channel 4 and that was great because then I was immersed in the world of television. 